Okie dokie. Apparently I'm live. All right, welcome to week 10, 11, whatever it is now. Um, we are going to start talking about programming the database now. So far, you guys have experienced SQL last term. And this term you learned about design. And you learn about administration. Now you're going to learn how to program. Um, by now, some of the topics that are sometimes covered in these types of things aren't covered as much detail because by now you guys should know what a statement is. If you don't know what an if statement is and you're already in level two, not a good sign. Um, if you don't know what you know a loop is, whatever syntax used for a loop, yeah, I think you need to uh, go talk to someone because it's not going to go well. Because uh, I'm going to skim that stuff very, very quickly, just pointing out what the syntax is, and that's about it. Um, that having been said, uh, this week I start with stored procedures and functions. And I need to um, define a little bit a stored procedure versus a function. And I've had various slideshows over the years that cover this kind of stuff, and none of them, none of them are quite right. So I kind of Pardon the phrase, bastardize a set of slides this week. And they're still not quite right because it's hard to explain. Um, different database servers treat store procedures and functions differently. For example, in Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, uh, there's no difference. They, uh, they have a store procedure and they have a function. Um, they are essentially the same thing except a function can only ever return one thing. A sort procedure can return uh, a set of records or it could return multiple things back out of itself. Whereas a function can only ever return one thing. Just like a function in Java or Python, it only ever returns one thing. In the sense that whether it returns to you an array or an object, it's returning to you one thing of one type. Uh, a stored procedure can be set up so that it can return multiple things out of it. So you could set three different variables based on a single procedure call. Um, and the other thing about uh, the only the other difference for other database servers such as Postgres and Oracle, there is no difference between a stored procedure and a function. A function is a stored procedure. A stored procedure is a function. You, they, they're used interchangeably. They do the same job. Um, the only difference between uh, what Postgres sees as a stored procedure and what MySQL sees as a stored procedure is psychological. Um, usually, a stored procedure does a job. As in, you use it to maintain data, to loop through multiple records, that kind of thing. A function is used to work on a unique piece of data. For example, you want to strip all the special characters out of a string. That is the difference between a function and a, and a stored procedure. You use stored procedure for maintenance, you use a function for an inline call. Yay. Um, but what's the same between them? They use the same language, they use the same syntax, they use the same structure. Um, the biggest difference is the actual create statement between the two makes the biggest difference. Uh, there are some stupid things when you're dealing with MySQL for this, and I'll be discussing them in detail momentarily. Uh, but a stored procedure contains a sequence of SQL commands that is stored directly inside the database. So that means that a program or an SQL statement or a cron job or something can call the stored procedure and make stuff happen. Uh, this kind of stuff would be uh, log calling, uh, cleaning up various pieces of data, archiving data would be possible uses. Um, there's several examples in the slideshow, so I won't go over the syntax too much here. Um, the difference is that stored procedures have multiple parameters, and they're either defined as in parameters, out parameters, or in outs. In other words, it comes in and it goes right back out. Um, in mode allows you to pass values in, out mode passes value back out, and they don't talk about in out because in out is both put together. 
So we're going to start with, wow, that's interesting. My slideshow is having chat, is feeling challenged um, for some unknown reason. So I've got two tables as my example here. I've got employees and departments. And basically each employee belongs at a department. And if we want to keep track of the total salaries, which is something that is common, and for small organizations, you wouldn't create a third table like this. Um, you wouldn't create a third table like this, but for a huge organization where you need to summarize your overhead costs on a, say, quarterly basis, you don't want to run a magic report that calculates everybody's salaries every time. Can you imagine how long that report take if you ran it against the federal government? They can't even get payroll right. Can you imagine how bad the report would have to run to try to extract their salaries and have it? Uh, so what would happen is you'd have a, a job that would run, say, nightly, updating some statistics. And I'm going to do up an example of how to create it. That would do an update statement. The first thing you'll notice is this delimiter command. That's a command you guys have never seen, and it's unique to MySQL. Now, in MySQL, what is the command terminator? Semicolon, just like in Java and C and Java, uh, JavaScript, PHP, not in Python. Uh, but the command terminator is semicolon, which means in a single command line, you can type in three different commands, shove a semicolon between each of them, and it'll run all three when you hit enter. N but the problem is that you also have to use semicolons inside of stored procedures functions and later on triggers. So what happens when there's a, it detects a semicolon halfway through the declaration? It's going to go, no. So MySQL created this said, oh, we have an easy answer for this. And they said, we're going to we're going to let you change the meaning of the terminator. So semantically, you can go and change a terminator from semicolon to anything you darn want. It can be any string, special character combination, whatever you want. In this case, it's changing it to double slash. A popular one is double dollar sign. And why is double dollar sign popular? Uh, because every once in a while, the double slash acts funny on a Mac. Don't know what it is about Macs and MySQL, but MySQL sometimes barks on the double forward slash. Why? Mac. Um, but essentially, the purpose of the delimiter command is to switch from a semicolon to anything else you want. Uh, double dollar sign is popular because it's used in both MySQL and in Postgres. Postgres, you can't change the delimiter for this kind of stuff. It, it uses double dollar sign for identifying command blocks. So people have started using double dollar sign on both sides of the equation. Um, so I'm going to create. I'm going to move to the next slide, which is a slight example of a procedure. And you can see I change the delimiter at the top. I create a parameter. I mean a procedure with a parameter. It's an in parameter. It's an integer. Then we've got a couple of other chunks in here. There's a begin and end. Um, I'll give you three guesses what the purpose of begin and end is. It starts and ends the code. Inside of that, you can have as much code as you want. Uh, in this case, it's just a straight up SQL statement. Um, it's updating the department salary. It sets the salary to some piece of math where the parameter matches the department number. It ends. It puts in double slashes here because at this point in time, everywhere in here, the semicolon has been told this is no longer a command terminator. It's just another character. The command terminator is double slash. So instead of hitting this and trying to execute, it ignores that, ignores end, and then it waits till it hits the double slash to actually execute. And then, then it's all good. Um, then you're supposed to set the delimiter back to semicolon so you can actually test your code. That's a common mistake when you first start working with store procedures and functions in MySQL. You change your delimiter, then you forget to change your delimiter. And then everything goes horribly wrong. Um, as determined in three. So, which is at the end is step three, which is change the delimiter back to a semicolon, like this. 
So you change your delimiter at the beginning, you set your procedure, and then you reset it back to what it was originally. So the other step you have also is when you actually want to call the procedure, it's different than when you call a function. And I'll be doing examples of both. If for now, you guys have probably seen some functions in MySQL. You've seen the aggregate functions. You guys remember what aggregate functions are? Sum, min, max, count. Those are functions. So you call functions as part of a select statement. Or you can call inside of a procedure. However, if you want to call a procedure as and you want to execute the procedure, you use the call command. And it looks like this. Call space the procedure with all whatever parameters it needs. And poof. You have code that executes. And if you're lucky, it's like magic. If you're not lucky, well, it's not like magic. Um, then you get error messages and you got to debug. And it would build something like this. Um, there's also a command called show procedure status. Its purpose in life is to tell you what all the stored procedures are. It defines all kinds of stuff uh, that you'll with it, including the definer, the what kind is it? Is it procedure? That kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to nuke a procedure, it's drop procedure, whatever its name is, without the brackets. Otherwise, it just says, no, you're not allowed to do that. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, that's also a spot where MySQL is different from other SQL uh, database servers and SQL servers. Uh, Postgres, you have to give it the exact definition of the command to be able to drop it. Um, same thing with Oracle, Microsoft, SQL Server, which is why so many people prefer using the GUIs. Right click, drop object. Because um, the implementation is a little different from each of them. All right. And the last thing that you need to know about, really, for sort of procedures, because I'm going to actually, this class is going to be more like a big demo class, but I have to get rid of the initial stuff. Uh, you can use variables. There's flow control, including if, then, else, while, and repeat. Um, it supports cursors, but I'm not covering cursors till next week because uh, I'd rather go through some of the examples of creating store procedures and how you use them. And same thing with functions. <coughs> um, but essentially the one-liner is it's a cursor is used to loop through records. You run a query inside the procedure and you can loop through it. Um, there's a link here to bring you to the t to a tutorial. And as I was saying to the people in the lab just before this, I was contemplating, you know, a various PDFs to supply you guys for documentation. And I took a, a look through this tutorial and it was way better than anything I would have thrown together. So I said, you know what? I'm providing the link on, on Canvas. And I recommend strongly you go through that tutorial, or at least you read through the tutorial. It's nicely formatted. There's pictures. There's, you know, color coding. Everything's there that you need. Um, there's examples on how to do it. There's even little sample databases you can download. Um, the sample database I'm going to be using today is on Canvas. So if, if one of you wants to try to follow along, I'll give you guys a minute or two to go to today's module and uh, suck it down. You need to create a database and import it. Um, what is it? It's a two-table database. One has employees and the other one is the summary of their salaries. It's a different structure than what's in the slideshow. Um, but it will cover the examples of what I'm after. And I'll show you examples of a simple stored procedure, a somewhat more complex stored procedure. And then I'll show you guys a function call. Uh, I'll explain the logic behind them. that okay. 
Fness. Hey, look at that, it came up in the right place. All right. Now I am going to show uh, a few different examples. I just need to get one more thing up. Whew, I thought I lost my examples. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the contents of the employees table. If I actually hit the run button in the right spot. There we go. Now. I made this example a little bit simpler than the other one that was even in the slideshow. I did a two-table solution. No, it's not designed right. No, it's not normalized. I know. But for this, for all intents and purposes, I decided to keep it simple just for these examples. Uh, what do you have in here? You got your primary key, you got a first name, last name, a date of birth, a department, and a salary. Very basic employees table. Uh, there's also a table called department salaries which is empty. The first sort procedure we're going to create is its purpose in life, excuse me, is to make sure that we update just the correct salaries for everything and for the correct people. And now if you're really, really lucky, you're going to end up working for a company that actually gives you uh, Annual cost of living increases. Those are rare, unless you work for the government. Or you work for a really big company that's making lots of money. Um, those of you that don't know what an annual cost of living increase is, when the company automatically increases your salary based on the inflation rate. Normally they give you basically 4% a year. Um, out of the, the various contacts I've gotten in the industry, I think in the last five years I've had one cost of living increase. And a couple of my other buddies have had maybe two in the last 10 years. Um, because, you know, if you get an annual raise, then you don't get the cost of living increase. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a procedure to give automatically give everybody a 4% raise every year. So if we remember right, we got to change our delimiter to something else. Otherwise, the whole thing's going to bomb out. And actually, in a few minutes, I'll show you guys what happens if you don't change the delimiter. So I'm going to create a store procedure called annual cost of COL, cost of living raise. There's no parameters because everybody should get the raise, regardless. And now we create our begin block. And if you're a good little programmer, you get into the habit really fast of terminating all your commands. Now, in theory, you can put in your semicolon here if you want. Uh, you don't need it. But as every, it's just like, you know, when you create your if statements. Sorry, you guys are Python people, right? Okay, C sharp. You know, you open your curly, you got to make sure you close your curly, otherwise bad things happen. Uh, usually known as a compiler. Um, or if you're using PHP, it just gives you a 500 error, end of the world. Uh, unable to compile script. Um, you, you get into the habit of opening and closing your curlies and your brackets and your braces. Um, then your parentheses, because they all come in pairs. Creating SQL procedures and functions, you get the same thing. It's just you got to get in the habit of creating your begin and your end statement right off the bat, otherwise bad things are going to happen. So my first command I'm going to do, I'm going to end update employees. And I'm going to set, I'm going to put some tabbing in here. Their salary to be equal to their salary 
I can type the word salary in. Like that. And then as a rule, you always reset your delimiter to a semicolon. Now, I wonder if I can make this, oh, there we go. It's probably be a little bit better for everybody's viewing pleasure. Like that. All right, so I'm going to update employees. I'm going to set their salary to 1.04% of their original salary. That's the, that's the easy way of doing the math. Um, an alternate way of doing the math would have been and that would do the same thing. Just putting it out there. That's a choice you have. Um, later on, I've actually written a chunk of code that handles something better than that. All right, I'm going to hit the run button. And I got a mistake. And what does the what does my mistake say? Oh, because the procedure already exists. Why does it already exist? Because I went through this earlier to make sure that everything worked right. And I forgot to clean out myself. Yeah, now let's try that again. Woo! It worked the second time. Yes. What this does, it saves you putting the delimiter above and below it. Yeah. Yeah, they show you, you know, you can do it from the command line. You can do it from this tool. Most GUIs have a store procedure editor. Um, And I'm just loading something here, maybe. Um, actually, this one doesn't have that. <coughs> Go figure. Um, <coughs> I use an editor called Data Grip, and it has a routine editor, and it does the exact same thing. All it does, it saves you the, um, yeah, so it just gives you that gapping. Uh, you're better off getting in the habit of doing this in case you have to work through PHP my admin or you just force go down the command line. It's just getting into this habit is better because then you're used to it. Uh, but if you get to use the GUI, power to you. Um, it saves you two commands. All right, so this was created, an actual fact. So now I'm going to go and say, like this. I'm going to run that just this command. Now, as you can see, our, here's our salary. Let's try to remember the first one. So uh, Aaron here made 51,177. If I were to go and do this, which I'm now calling the store procedure, and I go run. Did that run? Probably. Oh, come on. That drives me insane. I even turned that off earlier. Let's see if it works this time. There, it worked that time. Um, MySQL Workbench has some bad habits. It tries to assume you're an idiot and protects you from yourself, a bit like a Mac. And now you can see Erin now got a raise. She was at 51,177. She got a 4% raise, which gave her this amount of her salary. 
So essentially, this is the simplest store procedure you'll ever find. Um, it basically, you can call it, magic happens, it's all good. Um, and now I am going to create a different one. But this time I'm going to forget, I'm going to forget to set uh, the delimiter. All right, so I'm going to try to run this. As you notice, I didn't change my delimiter. And you get a message that says something like this. You have an error in your syntax. Check here. And here's why. I started this create procedure. I have a begin statement. I have an update, and then I hit the semicolon. Because I didn't change the meaning of semicolon, or I didn't change what the delimiter was. It assumes that the entire command ends here. And now I get an end statement here that's broken. So what you end up wanting to do is you go, you do this, then you do this, then you go back to semicolon, and now we run it. And it ran. Why? Because it no longer it no longer thinks that the semicolon is a command terminator, it just assumes it's another character. When MySQL goes to execute this command, like this procedure, it basically reads all the statements inside and then it interprets the semicolon as terminators at that point. But while you're defining it, you have to tell it, for now, just ignore this. Like, this is not the kind of terminator you want today. All right, so. Again, here's my salaries and Aaron McLaughlin again has 52 whatever. Let's just say I wanted to actually have a better raise and give everybody a pretty serious raise. Um, now let's just say I want to give everybody a 10% raise because we had a really good year. So again, 10% is you know 110% of the original salary. So we're going to go hit the lightning bolt on this and see what happens. So in theory, hers should go up by about five grand. And hit run. It ran, nothing exploded. I'm going to do this. And now you can see she went from 53, 52, 53 to 58. So there's her 10% raise. Uh, this is an example of an in parameter. Uh, you can also do an out parameter which returns the results of how many records are updated. Uh, you can use it for all kinds of stuff. Um, when you look at uh, the examples that's on the tutorial that I linked on, on Canvas, they actually show several examples of in and out parameters and how you'd want to use them. So we're going to make one last one, one last procedure. And this last procedure is a mimic of the one we just had uh, in the slideshow where I summarize the salaries. But instead of summarizing the salaries on a per department basis, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to summarize the salary um, for, all the, for all the departments. So it'd be a job you'd run nightly. So at midnight, you'd have a bunch of procedures you run one after another. And you'd create a shell script on on your on your server, and it would get called part of the cron job. And I don't know if I'm speaking a foreign language right now. Um, how many of you have actually followed sort of what I was saying? How many of you took Linux? 
Okay. Do you guys know what a batch file is? Okay, got two heads going. Okay, this isn't going well. Computers allow you to have a series of command you can, commands you can run. Think of it sort of like a, a really dumbed down programming language, and that is shell scripting. And in under Windows, it's called a batch command or a command file. And in that is a series of commands you're going to execute. I, what you do is you put that somewhere on the file system, and then you can create what's called a, a cron job. Or in Windows, it's known as a scheduled task. I have no idea what it's called on a Mac. But it basically put what they do is they actually give you a pretty little UI, and then it puts it in a cron job. They're just hiding the cron jobs from you. And what happens, the cron jobs are chronometer jobs. They run every so many minutes or every so many days or hours. And then it looks at all the files in that directory, and it runs them one after another. And if you have your commands in there, congratulations, your commands are going to get run once a day. And you'd set up all these kinds of batch jobs to run at night so that you're not impacting company-wide performance. Um, for example, updating summary tables, uh, summarizing the day's sales into a summary table so that uh, the sales reps can run a report quickly. Instead of having to pull, you know, all the sales for the last six months, they can look at the daily summaries for the last six months. Maybe you want to do a monthly summary once a month. You know, the start of the month, you want to do last month's sales. You have a summary table that's built like this. Uh, these are the kinds of procedures you'd use for this. So, I'm going to call this one summarize salaries. It's not going to have any parameters because it's a it's a self-contained job. And we're going to put in our begin and our end statements, as always. And the first thing we want to do is not misspell the word truncate. Okay, so we have a table called department salaries. And what happens is every night we're going to clean it out and repopulate it. Now, if you remember, I showed you guys here what's in it, which is nothing. It basically has a column for department and a column for the total salary. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to create an insert statement. Now we want to make sure our lists are nice and sorted up cleanly. And before I run this, I'm actually going to introduce an actual error in the code. So you can see what happens when you run one of these and there's a mistake in the code. I'm going to take that out. I'm going to misspell the salaries table on purpose. So I'm just going to get rid of this stuff here. And I'm going to run this command. Go. As you can see, it created the, tr the procedure fine. But there's a mistake in the procedure. So if I go and I try to call like this, and I go run, you'll get an error message that shows that the table doesn't exist. It returns to your normal SQL statement an error message like you would have if you botched your, your commands. Um, so in the end, you'll want to recreate your procedure. And MySQL has a few strange little quirks. Um, I'm going to put in, I'm going to use drop procedure. You can, also, you can also use, depending on the version of MySQL you're on, uh, create or replace. So they got a command called create or replace procedure and the name of the procedure. The problem is that if you've changed the parameter count, it can't find the old one. And it gives you a weird error message saying that this procedure already exists. 
So from my experience with MySQL, just drop it. And then, hey, okay. yeah, drop if exists. Um, now, so I'm going to drop it. I'm going to recreate it. Again, no errors. One last time to prove to you that the voodoo is working. There's nothing here. I'm going to call my summarize, and hopefully I don't have a mistake in it this time. And it ran. And now I go do this. And here's our summarized salaries. Man, this company's top heavy. Um, man, that's a quite the expensive salary pool. $112 million in salaries a year. Then again, that's, you know, pretty much hydro, Ontario Hydro salary pool also. I guess it's not that unheard of. Um, so there's our salary, salary summarization routine. This is something you do on a nightly basis or on a weekly basis or maybe it'd be something that you have as part of your code when somebody gets hired or the raises come into effect. And what's kind of cool is you can call one procedure inside another procedure. So you know how before we have the uh, the procedure to update our annual salaries? Inside of that, as the very last thing you do, you could call now the update, the summary salary. So you give everybody their 4% raise, and then you update the totals right away all in one step. And you still can put, you're breaking down, I was about to say a word I can't pronounce. You're going to break down the code into smaller chunks so that it's easier to maintain. It's not magic, it's not a mystery, but that's, you know, how it works. Okie dokie. Now, there's one more example to do. And I'm going to create a function to calculate what a person's salary would look like so this is a function. So what's the difference between a procedure and a function? A procedure is a series of commands that can modify the data. It can return one or more values, or it can return records, a record set. A function operates on a single value, well, more than one value, technically. You can pass more than one parameter. Um, but it operates on a single instance, and it returns one possible value. So, all right, I'm going to set my delimiter blocks around it, as usual. All right, now I got to point out some things here. And I am going to go to the screen and move my camera. I don't know if I remember to put the camera back. Okay. Create function. Similar syntax to the create procedure. You give it a name. You pass in the parameters. But you will notice that it's, I'm not saying if the parameter is an in out or an in out parameter, because functions don't have out parameters. They can only take things in. Just like in Python, just like in C Sharp, the parameters in your function are the parameters. It doesn't define what returns out of it. Then the next line is returns numeric. It means I'm going to return a numeric value, a number with decimal places. Uh, why am I picking numeric? Because I'm not going after the precision of the float. I'm allowing a float to come in, but it's not, it's not what's going to come out. All right. Not deterministic. That's a that's a very tricky line. Um, it's well worth googling what it does, but essentially, its purpose in life is to cache results. So, for example, if the previous command I passed in with two given values and it was it was set to be 
uh, deterministic. That would mean that if I pass in a value of 100 and I pass in a value of 10%, and it knows then at that point that it'd be 110, the return value, the next time that procedure gets called, let's say it's all part of the same transaction block, it's going to return 110, not actually run the code. It's going to look at what it did previously and return to you a cached value. It's for performance gains. Uh, when you make it non-deterministic, not deterministic and deterministic, it means that it will execute the entirety of the insides every single time. Not deterministic can be expensive depending on what's inside your code. If you have a lot of conditionals and lots of loops and you expect um, a different result every time, then it's not deterministic. But if you expect the same, if you pass in the same two parameters and you expect the same thing to happen every time, you should define it as a deterministic. Uh, in this case, I should make it a deterministic, but I, I'm leaving it as not for the example's sake. Um, which is something that application developers don't get very much is this uh, deterministic, not deterministic bit. Uh, because your functions in uh, C Sharp and Python, you can't cache the results of your function calls. You call the function, the function does stuff. You can't tell the compiler, can you imagine if you could tell the compiler saying, yeah, by the way, when you see this function call, and it's exactly the same, I do it exactly the same way I did it last time, don't run it. Just tell me what I got last time. Database servers have that functionality. And it's, um, it's good and bad. Because you can have false positive results if you start using deterministic commands, where you're saying, okay, I have, a, I have a function that takes parameter 100. And I don't know what 100 actually does, but it modifies 85 records. And it returns to you how many records are modified. The next time I pass in parameter 100, it's just going to say 85. Really, maybe it only would have modified 3 this time. But it ignores the inside because it's cached. Uh, yeah, you run it with a different value. Well, I'm sure there's other things you can do, like there's there's cache clearing routines and stuff like that. Um, other servers have similar functionality. Uh, it's defined slightly differently. Um, for example, Postgres uses a command called volatile, which means it can change. It has one called non-volatile, means it doesn't change. And then they have one called immutable which means it will never, ever change. Uh, you tend to use immutables on procedures. When you don't expect something to come out that's different, it means it's going to run it, but not actually collect statistics about it. Uh, Postgres collects statistics of how well things ran so it can optimize its behavior. OK. Now I'm going to put in my begin and my end blocks because I'm a good little citizen. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable. As you remember in the slideshow, I discussed how I can create variables. And this is how you do you create a variable. You declare a variable. And SQL is kind of, well, i got to be careful. My SQL's syntax is special that way. It actually uses the word declare. Um, and you can declare multiple variables all at once. You can use multiple declare lines if you want. You can declare them anywhere inside the code, but you have to declare it before you can use it. That's all. So I'm going to create a declare variable called return val, because I'm going to return a value. And it's going to be a numeric. By the way, it's not case sensitive. I'm just trying to keep the, the uppercase for all the SQL statements. All right. Now, let's just say I'm going to call this function. And I am the decided that I will not allow values uh, greater than 1. Because I'm always going to assume they're going to pass me a partial percentage, like um, 0 0.01 for 1%, per, for 1%, percent, point 0.1 for 10%, that kind of thing. But as a good developer, should you assume that your end users are going to give you what you want? Never. Always assume end users are idiots. 
uh, because at that point you'll never be disappointed. So I'm going to put in an if statement. We're going to create a conditional. So if the percentage is greater than 1, I can allow 1, which means there's no increase. Okay, how many of you have seen the language called basic? Yeah, for those of you that have seen basic, this looks really familiar. For those of you that have not seen basic, um, this is the equivalent of this. First, the C-sharp people. Uh, if I remember in Python, which I probably don't remember well, it's going to be this. I think. I'm, I'm pulling that off the top of my head. I haven't touched Python in like three months, four months. And last time I did it, I was changing a label on a field. <laughs> so, you know, it's been a while. Um, so if percentage greater than one, then do this. Basic was great because you could almost read it like an English language. It was very verbose. It also allowed you to do all kinds of really stupid things. Um, we're not going to talk about the stupid things. We're going to set the value. Okay. So as you notice, there's a magic keyword here called set. Anybody want to take a guess why we have to use the word set? We're changing the value of the variable. Can you tell me why we have to tell it this is what's happening here? Not quite. What is this in SQL? It's an equality operator. So when you use the word set, it temporarily changes the meaning of the equal sign. Because MySQL is special that way. And they decide to make things a little more complicated than they needed to be. Actually, all database servers have this problem. Why? Because SQL uses the equal sign as an equality operator. It's not an assignment operator. Uh, if you were to do the same thing in either Oracle or Postgres, you'd use colon equal. Uh, a lot of people look at that and they go, oh my, that looks horrible. Um, but for anybody who's ever touched Pascal, it's like coming home. Because that's how you assign variables in Pascal. All right. So right now what I'm doing is I'm going to divide my percentage by 100. So in other words, if I feed in a value of 4, as in I want 4%, it's going to become 0 0.04. If I give it a value of 40, it's going to become 0 0.4. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set my return val equal to the salary times 1 plus the percentage. And I know this uh, looks kind of stupid because I just took 100 off the percentage. As a but if the person were to pass in something else, at least you'd be handling it. Um, and this is not the best way to write this. This is the Dan cheap lazy and trying to make a point way of writing it. Really, you should be handling uh, negative values. Um, what happens if they're passing a value uh, 1.9. You want to give 1.99, so you want to give for somebody a 99% raise. This isn't handled here. Or what happens if you want to give them 1.99999? It doesn't work. So realistically, what this should be here is becomes greater or equal to 2. Because at that point, you can safely assume that they mean 2%. But if they actually mean 1%, everything breaks. 1 is a bad number as far as this system is concerned. And at that point, you could tell it, oh, by the way, you're passing in the one. Then you'd raise an exception, which I'll be doing in a few minutes. Uh, but this is going to return the val. Then we return the return value. 
Uh, why do we need to put the bra put it in brackets? Because it returns a function call. Uh, you can choose, depending what version of MySQL you're running, you don't always need to have the brackets. I'm just putting it out there. You don't always need the brackets, depending on what version of MySQL engine you're running. So you try it one way. If it doesn't work, you put them on. All right. Let's see if my function creates properly. And I got an error. You're right. Let's try it again. Nope. Pre function preview arrays already exist because I didn't clean it out. Good job, Dan. Um, try one more time. You have an error. Probably. Oh, I'm not having a good day today. And it already exists. Would you believe when I was testing this while I was in lab, I got it right on the first try? <laughs> oh, look at this. We got a green arrow now. It worked. Yay. Okay. So now how do we test this? We go select preview rays. Let's say I want to do person that gets $100 an hour. And they're going to get a 4% um, a raise. And I'm going to run it. There you go, they get $104. 100 bucks is the easiest number to prove percentages work. What's 4% of 100? Four. And my function works. Now, in theory, you know how I had a store procedure earlier that automatically gave everybody 4%? Well, that was handy. Then I create another store procedure that can give everybody X percentage. And that's great. Um, I have one more choice for this, for that particular task. Let's say I want to give everybody um, a raise of a set value that works in a certain department. Right now, none of my procedures can do it, right? So let's just say I want to go do, I just need to go grab uh I'm going to use accounting. So the first thing I'm going to do, actually I'm going to keep this. So I'm going to do a test run. And as you can see right here, salary is a field or a column coming from employees. So I just want to see what everybody's raises would look like if I gave everybody in accounting a 6.5% raise. And I'm going to run this. And now, and actually to make sure that it all looks correct, Actually, I'm going to get rid of this statement up here so that I don't accidentally run it. Here's their old salary. Here's their new salary. And there's something wrong. Do you notice what's wrong? They're, they're not floats. I'm losing my decimal places. Anybody want to take a guess why? Yeah, the return was a numeric, but it didn't define how many decimal places, so it's rounding it. So, of course, what do we have to do now? We need to... Or you could right-click, or you can do a create or replace, uh, but sometimes it doesn't always work quite as advertised. 
So I'm going to make a returns numeric 10 comma 2. I'm going to pass in 10 comma 2. Why? Just to make sure I'm covering all my bases. I'm going to run these changes. And I'm going to take that out of there. And I'm going to do this, and I'm going to run it again. And now we're getting a numeric back, but we're still losing the decimal place. And now we can just keep playing and playing and playing until we figure out what the heck we're doing wrong. And it could well be um, that it's a combination of, oh, I know why. No. We also got to make sure a variable is able to return decimal places. Let's see if we got it right this time. We did. So, through my enjoyable torture I just did to myself, um, I showed you guys some of the debugging issues when you write store procedures and functions. And this is similar. Now, Python is forgiving. PHP is forgiving. So you've probably experienced how in Python, variables aren't necessarily a given data type. It's what they call loosely typed. How much are you guys enjoying uh, C Sharp now that you have to forcibly determine, def define every single data type you're going to play with? This is going to be a, uh, a float. This one's an integer. Oh, this one's a string. And then you discover halfway through that you need it to not be a string except in this case. And it doesn't work so well, does it? Um, SQL is very data type driven, obviously, because it's all about maintaining data, which means if you declare any piece of your code wrong, you're going to have some data loss. As I was demonstrating there, I am losing people's salaries. It kind of sucks. Um, not that I care about 17 cents a year, but you know, maybe some anal retentive accountant would. And since I'm playing with the accounting department's numbers, they probably care about those percent. I know our guy does. At work, our uh, certified accountant, man, he loves his numbers. And he loves them to be correct all the time. So right now I've tested my salary increase. I can now choose to do this. And at that point, you'll suddenly discover that I named my function kind of stupid because it's no longer a preview raise, I'm actually going to make it happen. So I'm going to do this statement and hope it works. 100 rows affected. Apparently I have exactly, exactly 100 people that work in the accounting department. If I go back and look at my employees again, you know what, I'm lazy. And we're just going to run this statement. Now everybody got a raise. So I'm going to run these two one more time. I'm going to keep upping their salaries. Um, they're giving themselves raises like Nortel accountants. Uh, the first guy had 88,000. I'm giving them a 6.5% raise. Go. Now he's got 93,000. Good job. Nobody's going to notice that. Um, but essentially, that's how you can use a function that you define to update your data, uh, which leads into this week's lab that obviously I didn't have, I didn't teach how to do some of this stuff ahead of time. This is how you do it. Though, well, that's the techniques you'd use. It's not the exact answer for the lab because they're making you research on how to do certain things. Um, any SQL function that's defined in the language, you can be used inside of a function call. Uh, you can create your own functions and call them from inside other functions. Once you've defined a function, you can use it anywhere. I can also use this inside the store procedure to use it to calculate. So let's, like for example, I've got a piece of math that handles the calculations properly. I can actually just make a function call that gets called, a function that gets called inside the call for the procedure call. Um, 
in case I didn't use the word call enough times, I'm going to use it. I'm going to use the word call one more time. Um, a procedure is called. A function is invoked. Um, other than that, that covers the basics of store procedures and functions. Uh, I showed how to use the if statement. I showed you guys how to define a variable. Uh, you've seen how to define the function and the store procedures. Everything works on the inside the same way. Um, and I am, I forgot to give you guys one last piece of information. And I'm going to make sure that goes up on uh, on uh, Canvas as soon as I find what it's called. Um, I'm going to, as soon as I find it, which I can't seem to find at the moment, off the top of my head, because I can't remember what I Googled last time. Um, MySQL has a ton of syntax. Oh, there it is. Okay. Just so you know what the language is called, you know how every language has a name? You've got C Sharp, and you've got Python, and Java, and PHP. MySQL's language is called Compound Statement Syntax. So original. Yeah, I know. Let's make our language be an acronym that's been used for years. And um, by the way, CSS existed well before this version of CSS. Um, all right, so I'll go through some of the samples that's in here. They talk about how to declare. And there it is. It's straightforward. You declare the variable name and the default type. There are a few other things in here that you should know about. Let's go back. The flow control statements. There's the case statement. Um, you guys might know what a switch. Did you guys learn about switch? In C sharp or Python? I don't remember what it's called in Python. C sharp. You guys learn, uh, the, I guess in Python it's probably case. Great. Um, so they have case and case when. So you do case, you set it a value, then you do when value, then do this. Um, it looks like this. Case v, so we're declaring a variable v. When v is equal to 2, return this. When v is equal to 3, do this. Otherwise, we can do a begin end. As you can see here, we have a begin and an end. So if you need to have more than one commandments as part of your structure, you need to have begin and end. It's the equivalent of the curlies in, uh, in other languages. Or your tab statement in Python. The if statement you've seen, um, loop, essentially you loop, you give it a label, so you can tell it to leave the loop. So let's say you've got a loop inside a loop. So you know you want to loop through i and loop through j. And you decide because i reached a certain value or j reached a certain value, you can tell it which level of loop to break out of. Um, not necessarily a fan. While, they do while, do, and while. Whereas you'll see some languages that do while, condition, do. It's just a slightly different syntax. Uh, some will have a do down here. Or some have a do up here with a while down here. Um, that's a standard while loop. Um, your return statement is, well, return. I showed you guys that already. So essentially, I will post this URL on Blackboard so you guys have a command syntax reference.
And then there's repeat. Until. So repeat always guarantees that the statements will always be run at least once. Um, whereas the while theoretically could never run. So if you know it has to run at least once, you'd use a repeat instead of a while. And those are the bits and pieces of the language. It's a really standard, simple language. Uh, the reason why they don't talk about all the other functions and stuff, because it's all the standard SQL functions. So if you need to mess, know how to mess with a string, go look up the SQL string functions. If you need to know how to uh, do some weird math, go look up the math functions. Or you need to mess with date and time, look up the date time functions. But this is the, the structural side of the compound syntax. Um, I'm covering cursors next week. Uh, it's a little heavier, to say the least. Um, it does talk about how to handle variables properly. Uh, there's scope, which you probably want to take a look at because you might get your ass bit if you don't know your scope. And that should be that. Um, now, I'm not. I'm going to stop recording. Here.